Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here uh, so early in the morning. Uh, just want to check that everyone's in the right place. Uh, this is your last chance to leave. They're locking the doors. I'm going to be talking about uh, implementing a lake house in Microsoft Fabric. So now's your last chance to skip out for a nap or something or some breakfast. Nope. <laughs> so quick in introduction. My name is Craig Portis. I am the Associate Head of Data Engineering for Advancing Analytics. We are a data and AI consultancy who specialize in Lakehouse. Um, I'm also a Microsoft MVP for the fifth year running and a Databricks uh, champion as well. Uh, you can reach out to me on Twitter, X, whatever it is now, and uh, my blog is there. I blog very rarely. Um, and also, I'll be putting the slides up on my GitHub uh, repo as well. Uh, I do some videos as well for advancing analytics uh, under the, um, advancing fabric, and I've got some stickers up here if you want to grab any. Uh, but I also have a very strange request to start off the morning. So I came down this week uh, from Glasgow, and accidentally, uh, when I parked my car at the airport, um, brought my son's prized possession that he cannot sleep without, his panda. So he's been on a bit of an adventure today, uh, this week, sorry. Uh, so if I can just get a little selfie with everybody, uh, I think that would make his day. So let me see. Let me see if this works. So everyone say hello. hello. <laughs> Thanks. I promise the rest of the session will be more serious. <laughs> OK, so I'll start with just want to kind of set the scene a little bit and um, talk about talk about the Data Lake House. Uh, so who's familiar with the Data Lake House architecture? A few people. Great. OK, so essentially, a Data Lake House architecture um, can generally be described, or I think one of the, the, kind of, or the main key attributes of a Data Lake House architecture is the separation of your storage and compute. So if we think about a regular relational database, we're thinking about a data warehouse, for example, you're sitting with everything in the one place. It's a SQL server. Your storage and compute are tied together. If you want to scale up that compute, you're going to have to build a bigger server. Or if you only want to scale the, the storage, then you've got to um, kind of increase that. Separating that storage and compute, when we think about cloud um, architectures, means that we can have lots of data stored, and we don't need to do any processing on that data, and we only process what we need to. Um, and that's where that kind of separation of storage and compute comes in. One of the other uh, aspects of a data lake house is that uh, storage layer. So when we're talking about the storage, it's been able to store our data in a reliable format that's going to give us all of the benefits of a data warehouse, but all of the benefits of storing it uh, as files in a, a data lake, and that's Delta. And I'll come on to that a little bit more uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, third attribute, when we start thinking about the difference between other architectures, is being able to process batch and streaming data through the same architecture. We're not having to build separate architectures, like a Lambda architecture, where you've got a hot path and a cold path. Um, so this generally kind of makes up your data lake, lake house architecture. And that's what we do quite a lot of with advancing analytics, um, mainly in Databricks, but also Synapse and uh, Fabric now as well. So who's familiar with Fabric? There's been a couple of sessions this week already, but OK, most people. So very, very quick summary for you. Um, essentially, Microsoft created uh, Synapse Analytics, was supposed to be a unified platform, um, and that included data factory elements in there, included Power BI, wasn't quite as unified as it should have been, so Fabric is essentially the next iteration of that. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than that, or it's a little bit uh, more expansive, but essentially there's two kind of core differences, and that the first one being one lake which is your storage layer under the hood. So Synapse never had that storage layer. One Lake is essentially your uh, ADLS Gen 2, so your data lake storage abstracted away. So you can't see if there's 100 storage accounts under there, or 2, or 50, uh, or 5,000. Microsoft essentially takes care of that. And that One Lake storage is uh, relevant to your entire tenant. 
So on top of that, uh, we've also, or on top of that, uh, one of the other key attributes is the fact that it's a SaaS platform now as well. So Synapse, you had to provision that in Azure, you had to create it, you had to configure things, you had to um, set up the artifacts uh, within Azure, and that made things a little bit uh, more in your own control. With Fabric, it's all software as a service, so Microsoft takes care of a lot of that in the background. So expanding those uh, elements, so Data Factory, Synapse, and Power BI, we get the workloads within uh, Fabric. So we've got our Data Factory workload, which gives us our orchestration. We've got Data Engineering, which is our notebooks. We can run Spark in there. We've got uh, clusters that we can run uh, data transformation against. We've got data science in there, so we can run machine learning uh, models. We've got the data warehousing element, which gives us essentially our same kind of SQL experience, working in T-SQL, working in a kind of more traditional um, skill set. Um, we've also got real-time analytics to be able to process uh, streaming data and work with Custo. Um, and then we've got the Power BI element, and a new one is Data Activator for us to actually action things on some of our data that's coming through. So that's what it's broken down into, is those, those uh, seven workloads, essentially. And that all sits on top of the one lake. So under the hood, um, you've got all these different kind of ways of interacting with your data and different uh, sources for the data. When we're working with data warehousing, we've got warehouses in there as well. We've got lake houses when you're working with data engineering. Um, Custal DB, um, which has got a little bit of an asterisk against it uh, when working with real-time analytics, and then Power BI with data sets. And what makes Fabric unique and makes it interesting is the fact that all of that is essentially stored in Delta under the hood. So that's really important because Delta is a file format that builds upon a lot of the benefits of using Parquet as a file format. Who's familiar with Parquet or the kind of benefits of it? Great. So essentially Parquet, um, uh, or essentially Delta is built on top of Parquet under the hood. Um, if you're not familiar with Delta, um, this is a really important one for me, essentially, because Microsoft adopting the Delta file format means that they're embracing that open source format. So Delta is an open source format. It was created by Databricks, but it is entirely uh, open source now. And that means that you can store all your data in one link. You could be working with other storage accounts. You could be working with Databricks and storing it down in Delta. And you can interact with that in Fabric. You can take your data elsewhere. Um, you're not locked into a proprietary uh, file format. As I said, it's based on Parquet. Um, one of the most important things is it gives us ACID transactions. So just like we were working in a relational database, it allows us to essentially read and write to that data without, um, and we're still going to get that consistency and consistent views. Um, and doing that gives us the transaction log uh, under the hood within Delta, which means we can also do time travel which sounds fancier than it is, but essentially that transaction log uh, stored within the Delta file formats, a uh, file format, allows us to look at our data at a specific point in time in the past. So we can go back and look at data as it was at a previous version or at a specific date. We can also handle schema evolution as well. And as I'd mentioned, we've got the batch and streaming support. So that's a kind of quick, very, very quick uh, tour through uh, Delta and kind of the, the lake house concept. Now, I wanted to, to talk today about how you bring that lake house architecture to Fabric, because some of the naming conventions are different. Um, you've got some of uh, the, you've got the capabilities within Fabric, but Microsoft doesn't really steer you too much in terms of like, I click one button and I have a full architecture uh, created. They're making it as simple as possible, but they're also making it flexible so that you can kind of bake it the, the way that you want to uh, create it. So thinking about the workloads within uh, Microsoft Fabric, I'll talk about the ones that are real. I'll go into a little bit more depth about the ones that are relevant to uh, a data lake house architecture. I'll talk a little bit about some of the architecture patterns, but I want to jump in and just kind of show you what that looks like inside Fabric as well. 
So these are the main workloads, uh, the seven main workloads that I'd mentioned that you've got inside Fabric. Not all of them are really that relevant to creating a lake house architecture. The first one being Data Factory, which although there isn't quite that feature parity there yet, is essentially your Azure Data Factory inside Fabric. It gives us the ability to orchestrate our data movements where we're bringing data in from source, we're moving it through that bronze layer into silver, into gold, uh, or whatever naming convention that you want to adopt. And we can do that with uh, either the data pipelines or using data flows uh, Gen 2, which give you the ability to uh, make some transformations on the fly as well. The next element is the Synapse Data Engineering, and that's essentially giving you uh, all of the kind of elements of that lake house architecture. So it really, really annoys me, and I hope some uh, people from Microsoft are watching this session, but the naming uh, convention of the artifact of a lake house, I would consider that more a lake room, essentially, because it's just, it is a way for you to store and interact with your data, and I'll demonstrate this as well, where you create a SQL endpoint off the back of that. But what we want to use that lake house as, one of our uh, individual zones within our wider lake house architecture. So the naming convention does make it a little bit difficult. We don't necessarily need to have one of these lake house artifacts storing absolutely everything. We've got a lot of flexibility about how we work with that. We've got notebooks as well, which allow us to do our uh, Spark. We can write uh, PySpark. We can uh, work with Spark SQL if you're more comfortable um, writing things in SQL. Um, we've got a few new elements in there as well around uh, environments, which allows us to kind of set some of the con config and attributes for our clusters, depending on uh, how we want to deploy that, if we're setting this up as a, a de dev environment or a QA environment or prod. Um, Spark job definitions for us to actually run some transformations uh, unattended. Uh, we've got access to data pipelines in here as well, but again, that's the same uh, from Data Factory. And we can import notebooks uh, externally. And some of the things that you'll see popping up on uh, some of these uh, workloads is samples or use a sample, which is great because you've got a lot of access to sample data within Fabric that just makes it really easy for demos, makes it really easy to kind of get started and try the product out a little bit. We've also got uh, Synapse Data Warehousing. So uh, you've got access to a warehouse uh, here and also the data pipelines. Generally, in a lake house architecture, if we were kind of thinking about a pure uh, lake house architecture, we wouldn't need these elements. Um, but there is certainly a case, depending on skill set, whether you want to use a warehouse or you want to use a lake house ar uh, artifact, uh, and you've got that choice to do either or. So let's jump into some architectures. So if we're thinking about, if we focus on uh, Microsoft Fabric, this is what your, your lake house might look like. So we've got our bronze, silver, and gold lake houses using uh, implementing them as separate lake house artifacts uh, on the one lake. And again, if you want to use different naming conventions, I find bronze, silver, and gold kind of conflicts with how people would describe data quality. Um, with advanced analytics, when we are doing this with customers, we'll generally use like raw, base, and curated to kind of denote that, that everything in bronze is raw. It's not necessarily usable. Some of the uh, quality of the data might not be that great. Uh, base or silver, essentially being where people would interact with the data and a nice cleansed, it's been uh, cleaned up, it's ready to go, and then curated or gold being, it's now been modeled, it's, it's there for end users, all the naming conventions around, around fields and things like that are all user friendly. Yeah? It depends. <laughs> it's up to you, essentially. So like, I'll go on to a little bit of detail of that in a minute. But yeah, there's, it's entirely up to you. Uh, sorry, the question was, would you normally have them all in the same workspace, uh, each of those lake houses, or would you have them in separate workspaces? Yeah. Data, I think it's safer now uh, to use the populated and stored source of code before uh, people 
So the question was, is there a way to take kind of definitions or metadata between lake houses? Um, so it's probably a little bit of a different um, way of approaching it in that how you're doing those transformations will depend on the tools you're using and also like I would generally say you want to be kind of building a metadata uh, driven framework around that and a lot of that you'll probably be baking yourself like um, entirely not intended as a plug but um, at Advanced Analytics we've got our own kind of a hydrate accelerator framework which allows us to ingest that metadata, store it in a, a SQL DB, and use that to drive the transformations to say, move, a, move this entity from here to here, apply these transformation rules, and then when it gets here, as long as all our dependencies are met, apply these transformation rules to move it to the next one. So you are baking that yourself, essentially. Um, these artifacts, like your bronze, silver, and gold lake houses, are essentially just shells for you to do what you want with whether you're doing that with notebooks or you're doing it with like data flows gen 2 or if you're doing it uh, with SQL or something else for example not at this point no no worries uh, so yeah this this would be our storage layer we've got each of our uh, kind of layers within our uh, data lakehouse um, our ingestion would be happening using Data Factory, so we've got the ability to connect to many different sources. We can pull data in uh, using that. And then, generally speaking, you would be using Synapse Data Engineering over the top, which is our work, uh, our uh, notebooks, and allows us to uh, run everything on the Spark cluster under the, under the hood. And then finally, we would surface that data out using Power BI and using one of the uh, kind of key features of Fabric, which is uh, Direct Lake. So as I said, Microsoft don't necessarily prescribe this medallion architecture approach. They leave it pretty much up to you, but the naming conventions and the kind of the way they've approached it is implying that lake house architecture. Uh, so you've got the flexibility to kind of bake this the way you want. If you want four layers, great. If you only want three, if you want two, um, that's entirely up to yourself. So as one of the questions that came up within Fabric, there's different ways to implement that medallion architecture. Um, and again, naming convention can be whatever fits your business uh, requirements and whatever makes it the most understandable for users to, to work with. Um, a fairly accepted approach is to have all of these um, three zones as lake house artifacts inside a single workspace. So we create a workspace, so like sales department, for example, uh, or sales data, and then we'd have inside there, we'd have our bronze, we'd have our silver, and then we'd have our gold. And generally, you also have uh, your QA and dev environments or however many kind of non-production environments you might have as well. So this gives you a good approach of like resource optimization. We've got three workspaces, our dev, QA, and prod, and that's all relating to one subject matter, and we've got our lake house artifacts in there. Another approach uh, to that is essentially a lake house per workspace. So this gives you much better security control uh, over the data. You can set security at that workspace level. You can have it much more locked uh, down for your gold layer. And when people are interacting with the data um, from a user perspective, they're just seeing that gold layer. You don't need to prescribe any uh, kind of restrictions around what they can, what they should be accessing or what they should be uh, working with. So that gives you security optimization. Um, and although that's good, if you think about this, you've got three workspaces for that single uh, set of data, whether if you're separating that out as sales, and then you're going to have three environments for that or four environments or potentially two, however you work within your business. So that starts to scale up quite a bit where you end up with a large number of workspaces that um, become or could potentially become an administrative nightmare. Um, so again, that's, it's entirely up to yourself how you want to kind of approach that and deploy uh, those lake house artifacts. So I've been talking a lot about lake house uh, here and one of the questions that came up before the session is whether you would choose a lake house or a warehouse. Um, and it's a question that comes up quite a lot when talking to people about uh, Microsoft Fabric. 
and unfortunately, there's no easy answer. Um, essentially, it's not as clear cut. Essentially, where you would uh, choose a lake house or a warehouse boils down to what that skill set looks like in your business, um, what you want to get out of the platform. And also, you can have both. If we think about that uh, medallion architecture, I could have bronze and silver as lake houses, but also have my gold layer as a warehouse. So where the uh, bulk of the engineering work is happening within bronze and silver, that's where we want to work with notebooks. We want to actually process our data uh, using Spark. And then as we move into that end user capability, I want to surface things on the gold layer using a warehouse, which is like purely in SQL. It's leaning into skill sets that may already be there within your business. Sorry? Yeah, so the, the data warehouse, you preempted a couple of, I'll just pop them up. <laughs> um, your main kind of tool that you're using there is full T-SQL within the, the data warehouse. So within Fabric, um, so you do have the, I'd need to double check before I say something that's NDA. Um, but within Fabric, uh, the main uh, workload options are data engineering, which is leaning into the notebooks, and the data warehousing. So if you're coming from a Synapse world, you had SQL serverless, and then you had your dedicated SQL pools. So within Fabric, the two of them have essentially merged, and you don't really see any of that under the hood. It's basically just you create a warehouse, and that is considered a, a SQL endpoint. Now, I'll show this as well, but when we create a lake house artifact, it also creates a SQL endpoint. And I can go into Management Studio, and I can interact with both in a read capacity. Um, but the data warehousing option is essentially that SQL pool on, on top that you're uh, working with, similar to uh, synapse. Yes, but you don't have an aggregated query that can go through the notebook with object placement. <laughs> so yeah, the main differences here is with data engineering, yeah, you're working with the Spark notebooks, data warehousing side, you're using SQL queries, store procedures, your um, languages and everything on the uh, left-hand side, you can work with Python, R, uh, Scala, SQL, it is just uh, SQL there, um, so there is a difference in syntax with uh, working with the notebooks than there is working with your uh, data warehouses. Um, but I can show what this looks like inside Fabric. So other approaches to this um, for organizations that might already have a lake house in place is basically working with different tools. So we mentioned Synapse Data Engineering before. You have the capabilities within Synapse to call Azure Databricks notebooks. You've got the ability within Databricks to write to your OneLake. You've got the ability to write to um, ADLS storage. So if you're already using Databricks, for example, you can start to um, integrate Fabric with Databricks um, and use the two of them together. So this is certainly an option if you want to have a lot more flexibility and a lot more granular control over things like clusters and how you scale up and how you work with uh, the data. You've got Databricks as an option there. A couple of differences between Azure Databricks and Fabric in terms of Spark is there's um, some version differences. Hopefully this starts to speed up a little bit with Fabric where they're adopting uh, like newer Delta versions and uh, more up-to-date versions of Spark a lot quicker. Um, but you've got that flexibility to use the two of them together. Um, and then another architecture that we're kind of talking to customers about uh, a lot recently is that fabric for the last mile. So where you've got uh, organizations that already have an established um, lake house architecture. So they're already using Databricks. They're already using ADLS Gen 2, for example. So they've got everything stored in there. But you want to take advantage of that uh, fast connectivity between your gold layer and uh, Power BI is essentially shortcut, shortcutting that silver layer into Fabric uh, OneLake and then doing that last step of curating your data 
uh, within Fabric. And this is something that Microsoft are leaning quite a lot into, is that ability to, hey, like you don't need to migrate everything over to Fabric. Let's just connect everything up. Let's make it nice and easy. Because as soon as you start to adopt this, like, this kind of approach, it will slowly kind of start to build everything into Fabric, and you'll start to use that more, and it'll start to become easier um, to actually just be using everything in Fabric. So um, nice sales technique. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I've talked at you enough um, with slides. I, I want to kind of run through, uh, show you what Fabric looks like, show you how you would kind of create these artifacts, how you might build out that lake house architecture, um, and kind of run through uh, a bit of a demo. So, uh, has can I get a sh quick show of hands of who has actually I uh, played about with Fabric, has even had a like cursory look into it. Cool, okay. Um, that's on the wrong screen. There we go. Everyone see that okay? Uh, okay, so this is your landing screen when you hit Fabric. Um, you've got quite a few different options in here. Um, as I said, depending on what one you click, you have the, abil the ability to create specific artifacts for that workload. Um, but you can always switch between them at this point. So I like to go through data engineering, um, and that kind of gives you that access to all of these um, artifact creation that I'd, I'd mentioned before. So in an effort to kind of demonstrate the ease of use here, what we would normally do is we can create a new workspace. So if I say SQL bits 2024, no, 2023, um, I can add some uh, details here. I can uh, connect it to a domain. Um, I can connect it up to a specific fabric capacity that I have. I'm going to just leave it on trial just now because that is fine for what I want to do. Uh, and do apply, and that will create my workspace. So everything you're working with within fabric is inside this workspace. If you're coming from a Power BI world, then that's going to be quite familiar uh, what that looks like. Um, so I've got a blank canvas here. Um, I can do anything inside this workspace. I and mean, when I mentioned that Microsoft doesn't necessarily prescribe how you uh, create a, um, a lake house architecture or how you create your, your data platform, essentially I can do anything with this here. So if I'm creating at my lake house, I need to create those lake house artifacts. And it's as simple as creating these, and I'll name them. I hate the medallion architecture, so I'm going to call it raw, uh, just to confuse everyone. Um, and that creates that lake house uh, artifact in the background, which gives me a way to interact with my data. Um, I've got options on the left-hand side there that can essentially show uh, tables and files. So how you're storing that data inside that lake house will dictate whether it shows up in tables or files. If I'm using Delta, it'll show up in tables, and I can open this, and I can look at the tables as if I'm in a relational database. I can see the data that's inside them. If I'm using any other file format, it'll show up in files, um, and it's as if you're looking at a, a folder structure. It's as if you're looking at a normal data lake store. Um, in the background, that has also created a SQL endpoint for me. Uh, so it's created a semantic model that I can interact with over uh, through Power BI. Uh, that's not expanding. Oh, well. Uh, and it's also created a SQL endpoint for me. So that means I can uh, go through that SQL endpoint. And I can, if I switch to here, I can switch to the SQL analytics endpoint. And I can just query that data using uh, T-SQL. So I can work with the data there. but that's in a read capacity through that SQL endpoint. If I want to write to anything within the lake house, I need to do it within uh, the, the notebook capacity uh, going through the lake house. So this gives me the readability within, um, within Fabric. 
And I can also use this in Management Studio. I can use it in uh, Azure Data Studio as well. So we've got a raw layer. I, I can also then create base. That should be a bit quicker. Um, and then curated. And there we go, we're done. That's our lake house created. <laughs> Uh, so that, that's our storage layer. That's everything that I'd mentioned as part of that, that storage layer. And although they're kind of boxed together, I think I've clicked the wrong thing with curated. Oh, no, I haven't. Um, and although they are uh, boxed separately, that is all using one lake storage under the hood. So that one lake storage being a single kind of storage medium means that I can actually interact with that across different uh, lake house artifacts and across different uh, workspaces. If I have the right level of access, I can shortcut my data and I can reference it from different places. Um, I can work with multiple uh, zones in here, all within a single notebook, for example. So in a bit of a Blue Peter uh, approach, here's one I created earlier. So this is that kind of same uh, approach to the lake house architecture. Um, and this gets a little bit harder to navigate the more things start to uh, come in here, so I can actually filter things. So if I filter it to lake houses, you can see we've got the bronze, silver, and gold uh, in there, and I've actually set up some components around that that allow me to work with the data. So if we think back to that main kind of architecture approach, we've got our source data. We're using data pipelines here. Uh, it takes a little minute to load. Uh, so we're using our uh, data pipelines within the data factory experience uh, to essentially copy that data. And, and you can get a lot more complex with this, the same as you can with Azure Data Factory, to be able to pull the data in uh, using a metadata-driven framework or anything. Yes? At present, oh, sorry, uh, to repeat the question, can you have different access rights within uh, the workspace on individual artifacts? At present, no. So you can secure the data differently um, under the hood, but the actual artifacts, when someone opens, if someone's got access to that workspace, they're going to see everything in there. Now, there's organization capabilities coming. Um, I am. Um, Sure, it was announced already, but the, there's the capability to uh, pull that into separate folder structures. I don't know if security is going to be attached to those folder structures within a uh, workspace, but at present, if you've got access to the workspace, you can see everything in the workspace. So that's that would maybe drive you more to use individual workspaces, and like I'll keep all of the horrible like engineering work and everything like that in separate workspaces and then have a nice clean one at the front that the majority of your users are going to interact with that's only got what they need to see. Uh, yes, another question. Perfect. Um, yeah, so just a comment saying, um, I was worried about breaking NDA, uh, a comment saying that the folder structure is coming very soon and they're going to be adding sh uh, security to that folder structure uh, at some point. Uh, so yeah, that gives you that capability to be a bit more controlled. You can keep all the kind of dirty engineering stuff away from uh, people that generally don't need to see that or work with it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, essentially. So the question was uh, inside Synapse with the copy, copy ability, you've got the ability to uh, stage your data um, and kind of work with it before bringing it into the lake. Now, the way I would normally approach the lake house architecture um, is to expand that bronze, silver, and gold layer. 
and actually have a, a layer before that um, described as landing. So the, the logic being that as you move through each of these zones, you want to try and limit what you're doing to your data to one action. So the way I would approach it is land everything into a landing area, and now you can create that as a separate lake house within Fabric, or it could just be the files area within your bronze uh, lake house. But landing the data as simply as possible, so doing the minimal amount of work to it, if that means dropping it in as CSV, if that means dropping it in as parquet or something, um, then you've got you're basically doing as little as possible so that you're ensuring your data or you're making it almost certain that your data is going to land without any errors or anything. And then applying cleansing rules as you move through each of those layers and transformation rules and then aggregations towards the end. Yes. Um, I've not really used that, the, the staging option, because you're pushing the compute onto Data Factory, or you're, you're pushing, you're introducing a compute component there. I, in any cases where I've implemented the, the lake house architecture, I would do all of that uh, as much as possible in separate actions rather than kind of putting that burden on th that initial copy over. So where you can, I would do that. But if you are in a situation where that is your only option, then yeah, um, use that. Uh, so yeah, coming back to this, essentially we are doing this copy. We're bringing our data into our bronze zone. Uh, so uh, let me open that up. I can show you. Uh, so I've ingested data from the New York uh, taxi data set. I can click on this. This is me looking at it in a lake house um, context. And this will load a preview of the data. I can see all of the fields. The fact that I'm using Delta under the hood and it's, it's parquet. I've got that schema for all the data as well. Um, and it's all set. I've also got another data set in here as well, which is, uh, if you can see the little icon, um, against that is shown that it's a shortcut. So that's shortcutted in from a separate workspace. So that means I can use data from other workspaces. And a lot of this, it's a little bit too much for this talk, but a lot of this um, kind of starts to lean towards Microsoft's approach of implementing a data mesh architecture for the ability to say, hey, I want to have individual uh, data platforms and workspaces for each department within a business, and then where they want to share data with each other, we can just shortcut it over. So I've got sales data, and I want to bring in my supply chain data to show what the uh, cost of the supply chain is into that sales data. So you can start to kind of bring things together a lot easier. Um, and yeah, so that gives me a view of the, the data within that lake house. Uh, I can switch to the SQL endpoint and interrogate that using T SQL. Is it it's not normal, no. It could be the first run. Oh, there we go. 178 milliseconds. It knew I was doing a demo there. Um, I'm also running off of a, a, a hotspot as well. So if I go back to advancing innovation, uh, so the workspace, sorry. So I've got my data in the bronze zone now, and I want to lean on uh, Spark to actually do that transformation. So as I was saying, this is us using the data engineering component. Um, and this is where the notebook actually loads. Um, so I've got the capability here to essentially run Spark SQL. So keeping it still oriented towards SQL. Uh, pull that data into a data frame. I want to do a little bit of a, a transformation, so let's drop a couple of fields from there, um, and then let's save it down into my silver zone. So that allows us to take the data, do some transformations. Now, this between that kind of bronze and silver layer, I'm probably dropping off fields that don't matter. I'm probably cleaning up some bits and pieces um, so that the data is a bit more usable. I'm, um, 
doing some data quality transformations, like is there any erroneous field, uh, fields in here or data that I need to drop off, um, and then pulling that into my silver zone. So if I go into silver, I've got the same NYC taxi data, but that's had those fields dropped off. That's had any cleansing rules uh, applied to it as well. And I'm hoping this doesn't take another minute and a half to run. <laughs> Um, well, that's running in the background for the next five minutes. Um, I've then got uh, another notebook where I'm doing my silver to gold transformations. So this is potentially where I'm doing a little bit to pull that data together with another data set. I'm doing some transformations with it. Um, here I'm running it with a full-on SQL. So I'm creating, a, uh, that was some prep stuff I was doing. Um, I can actually just run SQL directly in here rather than running it in a a PySpark context. So selecting from that silver zone, um, I can then create a table within my gold, essentially selecting or using some sort of uh, SQL query to pull from that silver zone. Obviously, I'm not doing any transformations here, but just for kind of demo purposes. And then within gold, I've got my kind of final data set. So this is the data set that I'm going to be showing to our end users. This is the curated data. This could be in my data model with my fact tables and dimensions and everything. Um, and that's me taking it through in 12 seconds. That's not bad. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's me taking it through each of those layers. So I'm doing those transformations, and I'm doing it all in notebooks. Um, and I'm working entirely in that kind of uh, data lake house concept. Um, and essentially, that's like, as I said, Microsoft don't necessarily prescribe that you do that uh, specific medallion architecture or that you need to go through each of these stages. This is more of that kind of lake house architecture uh, to say that we do it this way because there's, there's a purpose to each of these layers. Like this bronze layer, generally, I wouldn't expect anyone to be working with the data or touching it in the bronze layer. Data scientists, maybe, to see what that source data looks like. Maybe data analysts might be looking at it to see what the source data looks like. But the majority of our kind of more technical roles or uh, personas would be working with it in the silver zone. It's clean, it's ready to be used. I can pull that data into another data set. I can work with it and curate it. Or I can take that and make a build a machine learning model off the back of it. And then the end users are going to be interacting with it in the gold zone. So there is a purpose to having each of these layers within a lake house architecture um, and why we would have multiple layers rather than just bringing everything in uh, to one single pot and working with it in the same place. Um, so coming out of there, um, I can also uh, have a report on the top of this as well. And hopefully this doesn't take two minutes to load. Um, and is the most simple report created. Sorry if this offends any uh, BI developers or analytics engineers in the room. Ta-da, numbers. Uh, so yeah, everything is encompassed inside uh, that workspace within uh, within Fabric. And as I said, you've got the capability to, to split these out into separate workspaces. So. Excellent. Right. So essentially, like at this point in time, my kind of key takeaway would be slow down. Um, Microsoft Fabric is generally available. If you were asking me, and I would hope the majority of people from Microsoft do echo this, uh, is that generally available doesn't always mean production ready. There's a lot of elements in Fabric that are still missing um, around security, around networking and things like that. Some features aren't quite there. Um, you've got source control. So if you're working with a kind of full source control development uh, lifecycle, you've got source control on some elements. Other elements are still coming. Uh, you can do source control on your lake houses um, or elements of the lake house. You can do it on your notebooks. You don't have it on Data Factory yet on the pipelines. Um, you do have it on Power BI. So there's some elements that still need work that are still kind of in progress. Great for kind of creating a POC, creating out dev environments, getting uh, to grips with Fabric. 
but there's a lot of elements there that are going to block you if you're like, yes, we want to go production. Now, if you were talking about implementing a new data platform entirely in Fabric within the next six months, I would say we have a much higher chance of being to that production ready state within that kind of time frame. Uh, things that are still kind of missing there is like that security networking um, that's currently in preview. So that gives you the ability to connect to uh, storage accounts using private endpoints. So if your organization has security requirements to have everything wrapped in virtual networks and things like that, um, then that connectivity is there, but it's currently in preview. Also on premises connectivity, you can connect using data flows Gen 2 uh, using the, it's not the on-premises data gateway, um, but an equivalent kind of technology where you're standing up a, vir a virtual machine and using a connection point through that. It's not there for uh, the standard kind of pipelines at the moment. And that kind of echoes that last point of the feature parity with equivalent products like Azure Data Factory isn't quite there yet. That's the direction that Microsoft are heading, that everything you can do within Data Factory or Azure Data Factory, you can do within Data Factory within Fabric. Um, and the elephant in the room being that with the implement, implementation of Fabric, you're going to start to see less investment in those kind of core products that Fabric is based upon. So if you're on Synapse just now, or if you're looking at Synapse, Microsoft are never going to say it, but Synapse is dead. Um, essentially, they, the, yeah, the, the stance, they don't take the Google approach of just kill the product and move on. They leave it there until it, it dies in a corner and nobody notices, hope that nobody notices. Um, data Factory as well, there's some elements that uh, you'll start to see popping up in Data Factory within, uh, within Fabric and those features won't come to Azure Data Factory because the investment is going to be going into Fabric. So if you're considering platforms just now, you're looking at Synapse, you're looking at Azure Data Factory, just kind of be wary that um, these other things will still work because Microsoft doesn't kill products, but they're going to be investing less into it, they're going to be investing less features and things, and you'll start to see all the cool stuff going to Fabric, basically. Yes? So the question was, do you expect that if you um, that you would get access to on-prem data from notebooks directly? Um, I would say the best process for that would be to bring the data into Fabric or on, into your OneLake or some sort of storage account before working with it on the notebook anyway. Um, and that's the kind of patterns that I do just now in like a Databricks uh, lake house. Um, I don't know if the direct connectivity will be there at any point with pure notebooks, but if they expand the capabilities within shortcuts that you can shortcut to an on-premises data source, which I don't know if that's something that's going to be uh, considered. As far as I know, it's not on the roadmap. Um, then you would have that kind of capability within a notebook. But I would always say you're, you're, you're better bringing that off of the on-premises source into Fabric. There is a way that you could potentially do that um, that's in the works at the moment, that's in preview, is the by using mirroring. So the mirroring capability within Fabric allows you to take a SQL DB or something and essentially sets up replication under the hood to basically bring that into Fabric um, so your SQL DB uh, that's potentially in Azure at the moment, but on-premises ones further down the line would essentially have a copy within Fabric, and then you can work with it there. So there's some caveats with that and drawbacks and questions around if you're doing that on-premises, what's where's the work going? Like, is it your on-premises database? Is that application database going to have to do that work to pull the replication up, or is it happening in Fabric? There's a lot of questions around that at the moment as well. So the goal or the direction that Microsoft are taking with it is to make things as easy as possible for you to just use Fabric for everything. So I would imagine you'll see some kind of solution there, whether it's the best approach to do it um, or you're better taking a, a kind of more architecture-based uh, approach of saying, just bring the data in like I do with everything else rather than leaning on specific kind of features and, that are coming. 